Hassan, uh, good morning. Good morning, colleagues. I'm present. Thank you. Ms. Yaku. Morning, everyone. Happy New Week. I'm present. Mr. Mulder. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, all. I'm present. Mr. McPherson. I'm here, thanks. Mr. Cutler. Good morning, everybody. Mr. Burns Namashe. Monos Lalo Namalongo Ego Medi Gos. Ms. Muatse Chair. Morning, Chairperson, and morning, colleagues. I'm present. Chair, those are members currently on the platform. If I miss anyone, my apologies. I will. Um, and Mr. Thring, as he just joined us as well, Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Chair. Good morning, colleagues. I joined Andre about five minutes ago again. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I recall yes. seeing him uh, preening himself for the camera. Nomatan Domadaung is on the platform. And Ms. Matahun, Chair? Malamaja is also on the platform. Yes. Chair, Ms. Matahun and Ms. Mr. Malamaki, yes, Chair is on the platform as well. Okay, thank you. So we are quoted. Can we then have the agenda lighted, please? Okay, there we have the agenda. Uh, opening and welcome apologies, adoption of the agenda, the briefing by the NCC, um, we will ask the committee secretary to speak to us about the change. Then we have consideration of minutes, closing remarks and closure. Um, can I check with the, with the um, committee secretary whether we have any apologies? Um, Chair, we correct. We have full, a full uh, um, 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 compliment of the members. All members are present, Chair. Thank you very much. Can I have a move and a second for the adoption of the agenda as tabled? But maybe I must just ask the committee secretary to speak to the change. Because the last time you saw the program, it referred to the, the SEZ present, presentation. So uh, committee secretary, can you just speak to that one before we adopt the agenda? Chair, I will chair. Um, um, members, we received communication from the GTRC that the, 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 the presentation um, regarding the SEZ, it's, it's short notice and they won't do justice to, to do a presentation at such short notice and request that we uh, um, postpone the, the briefing on the SEZ for a further date, mm -hmm. which, which will allow for them to, to, to do a more substantive presentation to the committee. And in terms of the rules, the chair has the power to make such changes and inform the committee at the next meeting of such a decision she has taken in that regard. Hence, we took chair in consultation, took a decision to request that the NCC, um, to, it was on the program, brief the committee on, the, on today's date. They were sched originally scheduled for a later date and it was agreed they will be able to do it so today, chair. Thank you, chair. Thank you very much for that uh, explanation. So with that explanation, can I ask uh, for a mover and a seconder for the adoption of the agenda, please? Ms. Muatse and Mr. Mbuyani's hands are raised, Chair. Okay, Honorable Muatse. Thank you, Chairperson. I move for adoption of the agenda as uh, presented for us. Thank you very much, Honorable Mbuyani. Thanks, Chair, uh, for the opportunity. I second the proposal for the, the, for the adoption of the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we have the agenda adopted by the portfolio committee. So we will continue. So we, the, the, pur the purpose of the briefing by the National Consumer Commission is uh, to engage on each financial and non-financial performance 
for 2021 and 2022 financial year to date, uh, namely the 31st of December, 2021. This is also the committee that can assess the performance. Uh, sorry, this is so that the committee can assess the performance of the entity against its resource allocation in section five of the money bills amendment procedure and related matters act. So can we check uh, with you secretary who is on the platform from the department to introduce the entity? Um, Chair, on the platform is on from the DTRC is Ms. Matomela, who, who can introduce the delegation uh, um, um, attending today's meeting, Chair. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Ms. Matomela, over to you. Thank you, Chairperson. Good morning to the Chair. Good morning to the Honorable Members. Uh, Chairperson, from the National Consumer Commission, we have uh, the team that is led by the Acting Commissioner. Ms. Tezi Mabuza, she's accompanied by the CFO and the company secretary, Jefferson, and they will be presenting, taking the portfolio committee through uh, the quarter one to quarter three, financial and non-financial performance of the entity chair. As usual, chair, we thank the portfolio committee for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to the, to the entity, Ms. Mabuza to make your presentation to the portfolio committee. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Chairperson, and um, good morning to the uh, members and uh, good morning to the um, officials from the DTIC, the acting COO, Ms. Matomela, and thanks for the opportunity. I am going to um, share uh, my screen in relation to the uh, presentation. Um, can I check, is it shared? We don't see it yet. Okay, let me share that again. Okay, it's starting. It's okay, there we go. Just go into slide mode. Thank you so much. Are we there, Chairperson? Yes, you Thank can you. proceed. Thank you very much. As I alluded earlier, that I will be accompanied by uh, two of my colleagues, the CFO and the company secretary. They are both here. And just to say that the CFO joined us in August uh, 2021. Um, the um, outline of my presentations, of my presentation, we are going to cover the key highlights, achievement against planned targets, financial management, progress against the external audit report, and then the key challenges. Um, I am just going to start with the highlights right now. Uh, the first highlight that we wanted to um, share with the members is around our investigation with, uh, in relation to the pyramid scheme. Um, here we have a, a pyramid scheme just following after the collapse of um, uh, up money. Uh, last year that was uh, around groceries. We had the one that was around, a, that called itself Mutua Building Projects that promised people that they, are, they can um, put money in, recruit, and then they will be build, uh, build houses. The scheme, when we were alert to, alerted to it, they had already collected 27 million but then because we have to now understand where the money came from and what happened to the money, and then so that we can also assist that by the uh, Reserve Bank as well to see what happened and what, 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 what was the money coming from, is that it was already 27 million. But when we were now trying to preserve and check in the other accounts, how much was there and how much was left, we could only now, in all the accounts that were there, only preserve around 700,000, um, which was six, uh, 686,741 rand and 48 cents. But then the Mufua projects that collected 27 million from participants that transferred it to the name of our account of the Mufua, its director, one director, and five other individuals. And with this scheme as well, we had to, to uh, let our counterparts in Botswana and Zimbabwe, because we also had participants 
um, from Botswana and, and Zimbabwe that had deposited into the scheme 754,250 rand. But then the money that was directly paid to the uh, people in Botswana, it was only 39,000. And then the bulk of the money from the 27 million is that it was transferred into various accounts held by the director herself that the money was used, you know, so only like her personal account, her groceries, her clothes and all that. And as we said, that's the only money that we could preserve because we were alerted to the scheme a little bit later so that we can start with the preservation order. Another area um, that we wanted to also share, it was around the um, algae fruit juice, uh, fruit juices, PTY LTD. This was done after we had um, received uh, recalls from uh, Coca-Cola in their appetizer, Pioneer Food in their Sears apple juice. We had also liquid fruit juices, uh, the apple juice they often then Woolworths uh, apple juice. Uh, what led us to this investigation, to us now um, approving the investigation is that the common denominator in all these juices was that they had their concentrate from um, algin uh, fruit juices. So the investigation is still ongoing. We are still waiting for other reports to consolidate into the report because before we can finalize it, we do have um, reports, um, lab reports from the supplier, but we are waiting for lab results from uh, that have been commissioned by the Department of Health assisting us that they are doing with the Agricultural Research Council in terms of the uh, chemical composition of the fruit juices for the samples that they have picked up. We have also approved an, an investigation against Grand Sink. This was following the uh, allegations of consumption of unsafe noodles by the children in Febeja in this case. This was because the, um, the reason for us to conduct the investigation is that we had reasonable suspicion that was given to us by the Department of Health following the samples that they had picked up at, 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 at the store that were belonging to uh, Grand Sink that had presented some anomalies. So we had received um, the, 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 the report from the supplier that they had given us with some anomalies, but then we are still again awaiting the confirmation and independent uh, re uh, test results that will also give us a chemical composition from the Department of Health as well, wherein they have now given that work to uh, the Agricultural Research Council. In our discussion with the Department of Health is that we will get those uh, results uh, presumably by this week, I think they had some kind of like glitches in their system, in the procurement system, but they promised that we will get them this month so that we can finalize the investigation. As we said, around the food product is around the safety, not really around the forensic in terms of the cause of death of the children. We're just looking at the safety of the products. Now, in terms of uh, another highlights on matters that we are prosecuting, at the um, uh, tribunal is that in quarter one, our prosecutions resulted in refunds to consumers. In quarter one, we had refunds of 690,000 uh, in quarter one. In quarter two, we had refunds of 858,000. And then in quarter three, we had refunds of 45,000. And then accumulatively, we had administrative fine based on the matters that we had um, referred to the tribunal of uh, 785,000. This money, even if they are um, fines, they go directly to the fiscals through the DTIs. We don't keep any monies in terms of funds. We don't keep any monies. But then based also on our prosecution, we have issued 105 compliance notices. The value of these compliance notices that we had issued amounted to 23,447,000. This um, um, figure and compliance notices are in support of the clothing and textile industry master plan where in when uh, goods that are imported into the country are non-compliant, especially your clothing and textiles, is that when they are non-compliant, we order that the importer 
should either uh, um, export them back to the country of origin or destroy them in the accredited facility. And of all these 105 compliance notices is that this comes from a sampling of only 4% of the consignments that are being stopped by the custom officials for inspection. And then in terms of a product recourse, um, the role of the NCC in terms of products is that when we have um, an unsafe or hazardous products, the suppliers, they've got an obligation in terms of their quality standards to inform us. But when we pick up from any other complaint or so of any anomalies in terms of like when you will be looking at a grain sink matter, is that we'll either now um, look into either ordering the supplier to um, perform a recall. In the three quarters, in quarter one, we received 21 new recalls, product recalls, where in the, we had all the plans, new plans and all that. But then in our programs already, we had other 36 recalls that were ongoing, wherein we were receiving updates before they could close them. And then in quarter two, we received 15 new product recalls, and then we had 38 updates. And then in quarter three, we had 23 uh, new recalls, and then we have uh, 45 uh, updates. But then what we had picked up as an area of concern for us, it was the recall by Mercedes-Benz of uh, the five recalls that ranges from a number of services uh, that they have in their store. But then we wanted to engage with them because we could see that it was some of the areas that they mentioned that could be of hazard is where in the tracking system would fail altogether or the brake assist system will fail altogether. So, uh, and then because it's also a high end product and also looking at the risk that it will pose when the sensors, when the user or the driver would not sense if maybe in terms of the following distance or maybe also in terms of changing of lanes and all that they could not sense that or maybe their tracking would be lost altogether. We thought that this might be it because now people buy these cars relying on that um, intelligence. So if that is non-functional, then it doesn't actually add value to the end user. So we had engaged with Mercedes-Benz in the previous, in the third quarter, but then again, they have been asked by our um, investigators to go back and provide certain information. We will provide that at a later stage because the meeting was supposed to be in this month. And then in relation to food as well, the areas really of concern to us, it was around this um, notifications that we had around April juices. And also, as well, looking at now the issue of the imports uh, in relation to now what we had as a country, because some of the recalls would now be saying that either there's poor quality of production of food in South Africa, but again, whether when also when we import some of the concentrates here that we will also add into our juices, they dilute that, and we end up with such product recalls that tend to taint our brand as South Africa, but also, again, they make our products questionable for exports when we had such major um, uh, recalls. But then again, uh, it was uh, this one, it was wherein we had reported on in Sabeha, wherein we had this area. This area is not necessarily a recall, but then though it was around the noodles, but then we ended up with the supplier, Ikrendi Sink, recalling the product at uh, Kvedeha. So, and in this case, as we said, it was more around that reasonable suspicion raised by the Department of Health. And the highlights that we had around uh, um, consumer education here, the pro the, uh, what we wanted to share as a highlight is the uptake that we wanted to really focus on. We had a problem around advocacy groups and the involvement of young people, especially your university students that are, um, are that are studying law in terms of the uptake of consumer protection law in that specialized law space. So what we wanted to do, we focused our campaign for the youth bank this year 
in really going to our universities. We focused at the university, our focus was at the University of Cape Town and also at the University of, uh, of Port Hare, where we wanted, we looked at our trends of uh, consumer complaints to say, what is really the issue with young people? Because we realize that most of them, they do not understand that based on their age, if they are below the age of 21, in terms of contracting, that indeed they cannot contract formally because they are not really uh, emancipated adults in this case, but also to make them aware when they um, would be buying commodities, like getting into contracts like your jeans, because that's what they use their net sales minus for, going into the jeans by getting into cell phone contracts and buying clothes. So we wanted to educate them on their rights, but most importantly as well, it was to focus in the faculty of law, wherein we wanted to really generate uh, interest within your final year um, uh, students within the law faculty, because we had already done that with the University of Fort Hare as well, where in, in July we had now our first lectures of within the module of consumer law as well. Though we wrote down the, the campaign to them, but we also had to give in guest lectures at the University of, the, of Fort Hare for the fourth year students in just introducing the um, uh, consumer law module just to kind of interest and also to say that if you really want to come in and do your practices, we are available as the NCC within that space. The other area that we wanted to highlight as well is our coverage in terms of media to say that we really as the commission try to be as responsive as possible to media requests, but also to also issue our own media statements where possible. But then our response to the uh, media as well, and short that we received lots of coverage spaces that we haven't paid for. And the areas that were covered include your online scams and online shopping, your online investment and pyramid schemes. And one area it was around the franchise of Tammy Taylor, and uh, the biggest area was around product recalls. And in terms of media coverage, in quarter one, we featured in four TV interviews, 12 radio interviews, and 12 online um, uh, newspapers. And then we, in quarter two, it was seven interviews, uh, TV interviews, 58 radio interviews, and 38 online coverage, and 38 print coverage. In quarter three, it was 10 interviews, and then we participated 10 uh, TV interviews, uh, 74 radio interviews, and then we issued four media statements. So all this, as we're saying, they actually give us free uh, marketing and then also reaching out to more consumers. And our area in terms of um, overall achievement is that um, we had overall seven targets that are there in the APP. And then um, of all the targets that we had in terms of our ach achievement in quarter one, we had achieved um, six targets. In quarter two, we had achieved five. And then in quarter three, we had achieved six. And then I will highlight then the areas of um, where in we really had not achieved. So, the first area wherein we had achieved, this is wherein we are as a regulator expected to monitor the efficacy of our um, accredited ombuds and then present to them their deliverables in terms of their performance per quarter. And then also at the end of each five, of five years, then we review that scheme in terms of the manner in which it is functioning. So we have done that, we have um, now, um, monitored their performance in quarter one, quarter two and quarter three, and then we had no problems in that in terms of that uh, um, achievement. And then in uh, our second area in terms of planned uh, targets, it's on business compliance initiatives. And the reason here is to assist business, guide them to uh, comply with the provisions of the CPA. And in this case, most of our sessions we would be looking, we look at um, formally uh, at formations and associations and business associations and particular industries. 
And that's where in WeFocus, we normally try to have your either online sessions or person-to-person -person sessions in terms of workshops as all that. So the area where in we did not achieve in this, uh, in this uh, target, it was in quarter two, where in where we had um, now agreed with our associations to say that we will have those uh, sessions in quarter two. They were then postponed by the associations. We could not, so we could not um, reach our target. We had to reschedule for the third um, quarter. And that's why now it seems like in quarter two, we had uh, in quarter three, we had overachieved. And then the other area that um, we um, had um, achieved on, it was around the uh, business um, consumer awareness initiatives wherein we um, educate consumers. This will be the sessions not online or where instead, it's where in us as the commission would go out and set sessions aside. And then uh, that will be focusing, the focal point will be on consumer protection. And then uh, as well, sometimes we'll be supported by other regulators as well. So in this case, we would have achieved, but then in quarter three, we have overachieved in this area. But what led to that is that we had one of our regulators, the national credit regulator that had sessions in the Northern Cape, especially around the Spend Wisely campaign. And then we shared the platform with them in supporting them. And then, uh, then going to the malls around those areas because um, in that area. So in that case, then it led to these two extra awareness initiatives that we had because we felt that we cannot actually let go of this opportunity because the Northern Cape is one of the provinces that has been, that is being underserviced. The um, area that we are um, looking at in, in this case, it is around um, the issue of the explanatory notes. This note is where in when our consumers could be your small businesses or just ordinary consumers before they transact, if they want to understand certain provisions of the CPA, they would um, write to us on our advisory email and seek for guidance and then would either ask for information or explain to them in terms of the provision of the act, or in this case, would um, um, either it will be small businesses or maybe before they could even file a complaint just to see if maybe they are covered by the CPA. We had um, achieved well in this area, but then in quarter two, what had happened, we had brought in some interns and then we appointed also new legal advisors in this area. So it was the mentoring in quarter two that happened, but then also looking at now this, the, what, the, the, the growth in them is that now we were like, seemed that the number of days we have put to the act, they were um, uh, surpassed. So hence now the overachievement in terms of uh, quarter three in this area. The uh, other area that um, we really are um, feeling that we, are, we did not really do well, that is around the investigations. So we could not achieve in all three quarters. Now, in this case, is that um, we would see that in quarter one, we are approved 151 investigations at a go that brought the number of investigations that we had just in the beginning of quarter one at 250. The reason we, uh, we did that is that when we analyze the complaints that we received within 20, in the year 2020 and 2021, is that we had received these matters and then they were all within our ambit for us to investigate. But because during that period, it was in the height of COVID-19, we actually concentrated on the price gouging matters because we only have five investigators that were supposed to be doing the work, but then we had to uh, approve all these investigations because they were due. Hence now we uh, achieved a 74. Percent we we actually we did 74 and then our percentage there of the 250 matters that were supposed to be investigated we uh, our um, performance here was was at 34 and then also looking at quarter two again 
it was at, at, at quarter um, at, at 34 percent, and then at quarter three it was at 60 percent an improvement. But then what is what happened is that in quarter two we brought in interns that were supporting our five investigators to assist us because in in, um, in dealing with the workload and we had uh, three positions that we are using for that. So in this case now, the work, the mentoring and the coaching now is yielding results. So that's why now you would see that the achievement starting from just absolute numbers of 74 in the previous quarters from the five investigators, just pushing with whatever that we have here, is that um, then we were now at 121 in quarter three. But then we hope that by the end of the quarter would have achieved uh, would be on par in relation to the work, looking at the manner in which now we have put up plans to make sure that now we bring ourselves to make sure that all the matters that need investigations, they are being investigated and then to bring our caseload on matters that we're pending to be on par. So that is the area wherein we have not performed. And then the um, area that we had achieved here is on uh, for further enforcement, as we can see. This is where in we prosecute matters. Now, after we have investigated matters, there will be those matters where in where in we don't we, we do not we where in we have to refer further. Others we will non refer because either maybe the consumer received um, their. Um, that they received the redress or maybe they did not actually qualify for redress. So on matters where in the immediate further enforcement at the tribunal, these matters we dealt with them. In quarter one, we had 44, 54 of these matters uh, that we dealt with within the 45 days. Of the 54 matters, uh, 12 were referred to the tribunal where in we had to prosecute. Uh, 40 of them were non, uh, were, were, were compliance notices and two of them were consent agreements. In quarter two, we had 52 such matters. Nine were referred to the tribunal, 39 were compliance notices, and four we entered into consent agreements. And then in quarter three, we had 34 such matters. Uh, four were referred to the tribunal, 26 were um, compliance notices, and four were consent agreements. And then the last uh, area of product recalls wherein we monitor and then we get our reports and close off on matters wherein we have successfully uh, recalled those products is that we had done all of them uh, successfully. So then um, coming to the um, joint indicators, we had uh, seven uh, joint indicators per se, and then these are joint indicators. We um, only were aware of them at the end of, um, by March, we incorporated them into our APP at the end of um, the previous quarter. So we, we, had to, we were grappling in quarter one to understand how our work fits in because they are joint indicators, extrapolating from the work that we had to do because we had no extra budget or extra resources to look into that. So we were supposed to look at our own work based on our mandate then extrapolate based on that and say, how did we support these joint indicators? It was very difficult for us in quarter one, so we did not produce any report in quarter one for all the seven uh, indicators. And then in quarter two and quarter three, starting after there were explanations and workshops by the DTIC on what was expected, what the format that they wanted us to report on is then that we could generate reports and say, in industrialization, this is how in terms of the master plan we are supporting, let's say in the green economy, how we are supporting in relation to maybe the um, destruction of those goods in accredited facilities, and how do we add value in terms of the Africa free trade where in we're looking at the labeling of products and all that we could generate then reports in this quarter in relation to the work 
that the NCC is doing that support some of the areas. There would be some of the areas wherein we really would say there is nothing that we can do. It's not applicable to the uh, uh, NCC, even if it's like that, but we produce a report to say in this area, it's not applicable. So in all of the um, indicators, yes, in quarter one, we did nothing, but in quarter two, we could come up with reports. Now, when we are looking at the areas that we have to look at, which is solemnly in when we were looking at our indicator number one in our APP, where in we generate a report on monitoring the work of the ombudskins. Now, this is the overview in terms of the work that we do in monitoring the ombudskins. We're saying that these ombudskins were accredited by the minister to resolve disputes between consumers and suppliers within the spirit of uh, within uh, the provision of section 82 of the Consumer Protection uh, Act. Their role is to mediate and conciliate with the key objective of making sure that now consumer protection is accessible, it's free, it's a speedy service for consumers to get redress within those particular industries that have been accredited. The emphasis role here, we are more of a regulator than to them, where we monitor their efficacy per quarter, provide feedback, intervene where we should, and then every five years, we're supposed to look at the scheme itself, look at its efficacy, look at the weaknesses, and then um, review and recommend again to the minister. So their financial years, they run from um, January to December. As you would see when we'll be presenting it further, that um, now their report, that is for January to March, we are going to monitor it in our April because we get that report in the beginning of April. We will look at their report, assess it, look at the areas of concern, then provide them feedback in our quarter one. Hence, that is uh, now you would see that though it's their quarter one, it's in January to March, but then we report on it in our quarter one at as the NCC in terms of government program. And then based on the work of the NCC, now because both um, ombud schemes are now in their fifth year, in this year we have already published for public comments in December last year, the MIOSA code, the comments have the, the uh, space for public comments has already closed. We are now bringing in those comments together, responding where we could, and then working it into the code. And then the one for G CGSO, it uh, was going to be um, published in quarter four, but then I can safely say that it was published last week already for public comments for the NEOSA code. Now, looking at their actual performance itself, looking at the MIOSA uh, code in terms of their performance. I am going to focus on the workload that they have and the close the matters that they have closed successfully. Now, when we accredited the MIOSA code, we agreed on the standard for them from the time when they receive a complaint to the time where they finally close the matter, that they should try as much as possible to finalize this process in 30 days, a turnaround time of 30 days. Now, looking at the workload of MIOSA, in quarter one, they had a workload of 2,195. They closed 2,000. 167 matters in terms of percentage, it's 98. In quarter two, they had a workload of, uh, uh, of 3,184, and they successfully closed 2,034, which is a performance of 63%. In quarter three, they had a workload of, uh, of 2,964. They closed 2,318 matters. Now, when we analyze the performance of MIOSA, we are saying that they had their lowest caseload in their first quarter, which was 2,195 matters. But then it seems as if they performed better 
in that quarter relative to their caseload, because in their caseload, they closed 98%. But we looked at their overall performance in terms of uh, absolute numbers, is that on average for the three quarters, they would uh, close, they will close 2,170 meters. But then looking just at the numbers, overlooking the percentages relative to the workload is that they perform best in quarter three. And then we can say that Miosa is doing its best to make sure that their turnaround time in dealing with individual matters on average, that they remain within the 30 days, a turnaround time on average, where in their average number of days is 28 and 29 days. Now, moving to the consumer goods and services ombuds performance, I would again focus on the workload and the close matters role is that in quarter one, they had received 7,640 uh, matters. They closed 4,024 in quarter one, which is 52%. In quarter two, they had a workload of 7,000 216, they successfully closed 3,889, which is 53%. And then in quarter three, they had uh, 5,855 meters, and then they had closed 3,793, which is a workload of 64%. But then looking at the standard number of days, the standard number of days that we had for the MIOSA code, for the consumer goods and services ombuds, it's 60%. It's, it's 60 days. Now, looking at the discrepancy in the MIOSA code, we have 30 days. In the fast moving goods, which is consumer goods and services ombuds, we have 60 days. This is an anomaly looking at the fast moving goods to say, these are really kind of like now very, very far apart from each other. So this is what we will be looking at when we'll be looking at the code. But then looking at the performance of the CGSO is that they are mostly above their turnaround time of 60 days. It's uh, quarter one, it was 61 days. Quarter three, it was 78 days. But then only in quarter two, wherein it was really at least within the code, but then looking at the performance again, is that it was an actually at 53%. Now, when we analyze the, code, the, 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 the performance of MIOSA in terms of the results that we've given them is that in quarter three, their workload, it seems that they work better in quarter three, but they had the least uh, workload of um, 5,855. But then looking at their um, overall performance, when we look at the real numbers, absolute numbers here, is that in terms of the uh, numbers that we have on, on average, is that their performance is at um, 3,900 meters on average. But then when we look at the numbers, they performed best in quarter one. And as I had indicated earlier, that we, they are struggling to really remain within the turnaround time of 60 days on average. And then they performed worse in quarter three in this instance where in they resolved the lowest number of complaints. Now, looking at the uh, financial uh, performance, here are some of the questions I would uh, request at a later stage, uh, the CE, CFO to present at a later stage, but for now I'll present, she will answer some of the questions is that our revenue, and we rely solely on government for revenue. And then in terms of our grants here, we received partially our grants, uh, two thirds uh, of 70% of our grant in quarter one, and the 30% in quarter three. That would mean that um, initially in terms of our projections that we will get the entire chunk in the beginning of the financial year, but then that will also assist us in, uh, in revenue, where in, even on our projections, we had projected a revenue in terms of interest income of around 2 million. But looking at the grant itself, 
that would uh, meant that now our um, uh, interest in terms of to supplement the grant is projected for the financial year at 1 million. That still gives us a shortfall of around a million. And then our funds as well, they are deposited within the um, Corporation for Public Deposits within the Reserve Bank. That's where we deposit our money. And as well is that when we look at the budget that we have here, um, I think if my memory serves me well, we had a budget cut of around 7 million that again resulted in us having a very skewed budget in terms of the ratio of um, um, performance, uh, 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 compensation of employees against the administrative funds, against the um, goods and services. So that is the no uh, anomaly that we have here of 80% and 20%. Now, looking at the operational expenditure, this is where we are. Uh, in terms of the wages, as you can see in quarter one, in terms of our wages, is that we were at um, 11,000 um, in terms of our expenditures, as you can see. But then what we wanted clearly to highlight is that in terms of our economic classification here, compensation of employees and goods and services, as the split, as you can see, of the 80-20, which is really an anomaly that says that we have little room to wiggle when it comes to now using some of our resources or, or where it would need expertise in relation to, to supplement our investigations and also to supplement when we have matters that are taken to higher courts in terms of our legal services here. This is where in we are struggling. And then as we said that in terms of other subcategories in our goods and services, any item that is listed as a, that in terms of the procurement is below the 300, we just listed it as under. So here the CFO clarity sort will be given. But we are saying that looking at the work of the NCC and that now we, are taking more matters to the tribunal. If those matters are being challenged because they will be in favor of the MCC, because when we go to the tribunal, in most cases, we use our own prosecutors. Now we have now to rely on external uh, support and procure services of external law firms now to assist us in terms of senior counsel in now dealing with these matters. So our fees in terms of now our legal fees and all that they are really this budget is increasing and now we know we envisage that it will grow uh, exponentially going forward in terms of supporting our mandate now the area in terms of capital expenditure because we are a small entity we normally don't budget we don't even have room to budget for capital expenditure so we will now look at the needs like computers and all that, when we see that we would have either a little bit of savings on um, some of the areas, then we will use those uh, funds to uh, fund our capital budgets like our laptops and also um, um, developing some of the other areas uh, uh, in terms of the ICT. But then on this project, we relied solely on the DTI because since the inception of the NCC, we never had an ICT infrastructure. After we have moved and shared our building with the South African Bureau of Standards, we went to the department to request for funds. We were given funds simply to fund our capital projects to look at the ICT infrastructure that the NCC never had. So we were given funds by the, and by the uh, DTIC, thanks to them, to assist us in building our ICT infrastructure so that we can also come up and develop one of our areas, which is the opt-out registry. That is our mandate in terms of protecting consumers in the space of uh, unwanted uh, marketing. So we had to develop the registry itself. So these are the areas where it was capital funds given, it was a multi-year pro, uh, project. We have now established, finalized our uh, infrastructure, uh, ICT infrastructure, 
And then though it said that as of quarter three, we had the remaining budget of 7 million, I can just say up to so far, already we have paid just in this quarter, I think around uh, three point something million. That would mean that what is left or what we can really roll over just in relation to this budget might be even less than 2 million. We envisage that we will um, finalize the entire project of the opt out because in this area, what was uh, uh, holding us back, it was our MOU with the Department of Home Affairs in the interface that we had. And I think also the interface, the interface with the CIPC in terms of the registry of the marketers, that was not really an issue, but the interface with Home Affairs is what was holding us up. We already have had the MOU signed. We are working with the Home Affairs just to finalize this project. We envisage that we'll finalize it in July, um, in, in this year and in, in, in July, but then we'll start piloting it thereafter in the second quarter of this financial year. So we have signed off on the infrastructure, as we said in quarter three, but then we'll have to set aside funds to maintain this precious structure so that we keep it up to date all the time in terms of the software and also in terms of the hardware itself. So um, in terms of the progress in uh, our um, audit external audit findings, so we had uh, ordered, uh, audit findings that were raised within the area of human resources that was around our leaves and also around uh, contracts. Those areas, because they were raised only for that in, in that financial year, we have looked into them, they have been resolved. And then we had set up processes to ensure that in terms of the accruals of leave and all that, that we have systems, we have now even went back to reconscientize our staff on their responsibility when it comes to leave management and also the management of contracts. And then on our finance, those were around the posting of accruals and also on um, some of the areas in terms of the, um, the, uh, the misstatements that were really minor that have been finalized, they have since been resolved. In uh, supply chain, we had four uh, findings. This, the one, the, some of the findings were really around, mostly around the delegations in the uh, appointment of our bid committees and their role that has since been finalized and then we have looked into our processes to make sure that they fit our policies because in this case here yeah, the issue was our alignment and our implementation of the policies in some of the areas but the area that i think it's that we're saying it's still unresolved it is because it's ongoing is the implementation of our procurement plan. What was raised here on supply chain, it was our um, estimates in the project plan versus when we go out to the market, because when we were procuring the ICT infrastructure, it was before COVID. And then when we went to the market, the price were way above what we had uh, projected, I think with a difference of around 6 million. But then we did not adjust the procurement uh, um, plan as such to accommodate that. And so that's why we are saying that in future, when we have those uh, material variations, we will um, reassess our affordability, though we can afford in this case, our affordability, and then also uh, amend our procurement plan accordingly in relation to uh, the, um, the expectation or the guideline from Treasury. And then uh, on the other findings, the findings that we had that were really an issue here, it was around the asset management. As we said that we never have an in, uh, ICT infrastructure, we really had old, um, I think uh, what, yeah, yeah, we also had old servers. So those servers crashed um, towards the end of the financial year. And in this case, we lost everything that we had in our systems, especially around also the asset register. By the end of the financial year, we could not come up with either your uh, depreciation values and all that. So we had to really start afresh and set up that register. Hence, we could not even dispose of some of um, items that were 
that were already had to be decommissioned that were still on the floor. So we had to leave them on the floor because we did not dispose of them based on the lost uh, register. But hence now in quarter three already, we had um, finalized the asset count up to uh, the end of September um, 2030. We had verified the processes and then we had cleared all the exceptions. Already we set up our loss control committees and our asset disposal committee uh, and everything now it's been resolved. As we sit in now, we had resolved our asset register and in, in this case, but in quarter three, they were still outstanding because we had to finalize some of those processes in terms of the setting up of the committees again. And then in ICTU, we had one area in terms of one of the policy and segregation of powers. We had finalized that. And then on the performance of information as well, we had two areas that was really on them a misalignment in the reporting, we had as well now formalized that uh, alignment so that we make sure we have also a well-refined standard operating procedure that we are implementing to the T to make sure that we give ourselves room to quality assure. In terms of the external audit findings, we had 21 audit findings. By quarter three, we had resolved 16. Now, what is still what was still ongoing that was supposed to be resolved in quarter uh, four, it was the five, as we said, that most of them, as we speak today, they would have been resolved because they are now recurring in terms of just finalizing those areas. And then um, in terms of the key challenges that we have as the MCC is that on the onset, given the mandate, the bigger mandate of the MCC as we're having it now, we had a staff establishment of 132. Since then, the NCC looking that we had incrementally now tried to implement all the provisions of the CPA, including that this year we wanted to start piloting on the issue of the opt-out registry for those people that would have opted in so that um, now they can opt out. So we only had 79 positions that have been funded since then that are fully funded. Of all the positions that are 79, 75 are filled, four are vacant. The four include the position of the commissioner, but the other three positions that we have, one, they are all at low level, one for a junior investigator, and then two are for your um, at the contact center agents, which is really at salary level six. So we use those to complement our staff regularly so that we can have interns. And the other area of concern is the staff morale that we have because for the past, in 2021 and even this year, we cannot even afford to have our cost living adjustment as such because we don't have the baseline that accommodates that. Once we can uh, now even offer the 4%, it will have a ripple effect for the outer years, which would mean that it's either now we have to lose certain positions when they, they become vacant. And we, looking at our lean structure, we don't even have room to wiggle. And as such now, this led to even the high staff turnover, as I said, in the first quarter of um, 20 uh, of this financial year. In, we had the position of um, SCM manager that became vacant by the end of March uh, 2021. We had the director, that is the position of the director, finance and, and uh, uh, supply chain that the uh, SCM was reporting to being vacant in April. And we had the position of the CFO that became vacant in May because the CFO had to retire. So those are the um, areas, colleagues, where in we had this high ten, uh, turnover of staff in those areas that we need stability, because even if they will have counter, they would have apply for higher, higher positions, we can't even counter offer because we don't have the funds to do that. Another area of a challenge is that we had a number of um, matters, as we have seen, that we are referring to the tribunal, and they are mostly in favor of the NCC. Now that opens us up now again for those matters where if suppliers feel that they can challenge some of maybe the um, some of the fines that have been issued and all that, then they will go to higher courts. 
though we had a, a success rate with um, up money where in they were fined a million, which is funds that we'll get from the funds that we had preserved, but the matter is still at the high court. They are still fighting the preservation order. So in that space, we had to appoint attorneys, uh, external attorneys, because we are not part of the public administration. We cannot use the state attorneys to cover our matters. So this is an area that really is affecting us. And we think that exponentially it will increase as well. And again, as we said, the dependency of the MCC on other regulators, especially when it comes to food stuff. When there will be an outcry by um, um, citizens to say that, why aren't you recording this? Why aren't you recording this? If we do not have reasonable suspicion given to us to say, this is the commodity that we think that is compromised, we cannot recall. And again, even if we have an investigation, we will get the results from the supplier if we do not get independent results from ourselves as regulators to say the supplier's results were good and all that, then we do not, we cannot complete those investigations in time. So we rely on our departments to assist us. If they have problems, then they affect us. Though we try to mitigate that if we have a high uh, high profile matter, like on uh, your foodstuffs, like with the um, noodles, I will personally write, we write a letter to the DJ and say, please assist. And then we will constantly say, we are still waiting. And then they will explain to us and say, these are the problems that they are experiencing from their area. And then they will assist us as well. But the other area as well, wherein we think that we might be going into the risk is that we had set up this elaborate infrastructure in, in terms of the ICT now that we had commissioned in uh, the end of um, last year in December. Now, um, because now still their maintenance in this financial year is covered by the setup cost. When moving to the outer years, we will have to maintain the infrastructure in terms of the software and also in terms of the age of the software itself. We will have to get funds to assist us in this area. So um, colleagues, I think, um, um, members, I think this um, brings us to the end of our um, uh, presentation. Let me just, yes, it brings us to the end of our presentation. And thank you. This is where in I will end and I will stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to the, um, to Ms. Mabuza. Can I uh, open the floor mm. to committee members to please um, raise their hands. I see um, Honorable Thring. Can I see other hands? Honorable Yaku. Okay, while other members are still giving it some thoughts, can I hand over to Honorable Thring? Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you also for the uh, for the presentation. Um, a few a few questions from my side. Firstly, is uh, what systems are in place uh, so that uh, MCC could be proactive rather than reactive, uh, especially with regards to the Ponzi schemes, where you've indicated that this matter came to your attention uh, almost after the horses bolted, so to speak. Uh, so, so what systems are in place to be proactive rather than retroactive with regards to Ponzi schemes uh, as well as contaminated foods? And again, you know, damage is done. Five children have died with the contaminated noodles. Um, you know, challenges with contaminated apple juice. Uh, so, so the question is, how can we be proactive uh, rather than responding after the fact? Uh, second question is, how do you determine? which consumers are reimbursed um, and by what amount they should be reimbursed. Uh, I think you've indicated that there were amounts uh, over the different quarters that were reimbursed to the consumer. So how do you actually determine uh, which consumers are reimbursed and by what amount? Then <clears throat> what success uh, have you had in exposing and preventing internet or online fraud? Um, noting that personally, I've had two attempts uh, at hacking, uh, online hacking, one, my personal bank account, uh, and the second, that was in 2021, 
Uh, and the second was with somebody that was impersonating um, SARS uh, employee. So any, any success that you've had in, in exposing and preventing uh, internet and, and online fraud. Uh, and then why, why is there a target of 80% with, re, with respect to targets uh, for investigation? Um, I understand that 80% perhaps is considered to be uh, you know, a, a distinction, um, but, but when it comes to investigations, uh, surely we should be aiming at 100% um, and not an 80% target. Uh, and then my final question is, why was it that with respect to the joint um, indicators that there appears to have been a communication problem so that for the first quarter, um, it was un unachieved, the targets were unachieved. Uh, and so was this glitch in communication identified and resolved so as to prevent uh, repetition in the future? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Spring. Um, Honorable Yaku. Um, thank you very much, Che. Um, I think Honorable Spring has covered me, um, has covered me in, in, in some of the questions that I wanted to ask. However, um, I do want to um, say to, to um, the National Con Consumers Commission that um, I, I am very encouraged by them going to particularly the youth, uh, especially in the predominantly uh, black community um, to teach them about consumer rights because I know that um, capital or so-called uh, financial sectors do tend to prey on the youth particularly and, and young people in, 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 in kind of um, trying to lure them into getting more debt. Um, a question that I have is what, how, how much more can we assist in, in, in assisting the commission in doing its work um, to the optimum level that they can, um, starting from the identifying of, um, of where the issues are to, to fraud that is happening, then to prostitution. What can we do in, in assisting, advocating for them so that the law um, allows them to, to basically exercise their rights to the maximum possible uh, and better that they can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Yaku, and thank you for your well wishes for the week. I think it's quite upbeat to start your week that way. Thank you for that. Honorable um, Motawu. Thanks, Chair, for the opportunity. Let me welcome the presentation. Um, I have only two questions. On the second target of the commission, page 13 of the Conducting Business Compliance Initiative, only 15 of these were planned to be conducted. What is the reason for this low target? And why was the commission only able to conduct only three? during quarter one, two during quarter two, and seven during quarter three. The target seems to be to be low, yet you are unable to meet it. Uh, same can be said about your uh, consumer awareness initiatives. Um, my second question will be on the investigations and reports produced. You have done poorly in all quarters with 34% achievement in quarter one, 34% in quarter two, and 60.5% in quarter three. Your reasons vary from the lack of capacity to complicity of cases. Does the commission lack the staff with the correct skills and expertise to effectively execute the mandate of the commission? Thanks, Chair, for the opportunity. Thank you, Honorable Motawu. Um, Honorable Mala Major, Male Macha, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, greetings to all, Honorable 18 Commissioner. Let me also join Motawu to welcome the presentation. However, let me 
say, emanating from the pyramid scheme investigation, the commission indicates that the perpetrator has received 27 million from different people, but only 686,718 has been reserved, which is only 2.5% of the amount of money people were scammed. I think you'll note that. Why is the figure so low, the commission? Would you please expand further on this point? Therefore, secondly, the commissioner, understanding that the investigation on unsafe noodles consumed by children in Eastern Cape, where you'll talk of three from one family, in Pumalanga, where you'll talk of two from one family, is still ongoing. However, five children in totality were reported to have died from this, if we are to put that sum into one. And this family need to get closure. In estimation, how long will this investigation take and what possible consequences will emanate from this in relation to companies involved and directors involved? Thank you, Comrade Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. Honorable, can I just check, yes, Honorable um, Buyani left the platform. Chair, we will verify that, Chair, and we'll come back okay. to you. Okay, then, Honorable Burns, Ngamashe. Thank you very much, um, uh, Comrade, uh, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Um, uh, let me also join uh, in welcoming uh, the presentation. Um, and 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 also uh, take a leaf on the first question asked by uh, Honorable Malemaja. Uh, especially as it uh, relates to uh, contaminated food and how it has affected uh, our people. Um, to those people who live in rural uh, communities or rural areas, um, it's almost a daily bread uh, to be sold items that are expired, um, which would obviously feed to some of these uh, challenges that we have. And uh, in most likelihood, owing to levels of uh, illiteracy and other factors that uh, might contribute in our people not being uh, so circumspect in terms of dealing uh, with uh, these challenges. Um, what I would want to check from the commission is the extent to which they stretch their tentacles probably through their provincial footprint to have engagements for purposes of uh, maximizing their awareness programs uh, to rural communities through established institutions. In this case, you would have uh, policies of uh, our kings, you would have a uh, traditional uh, council uh, infrastructure where there are secretaries who are government employees who could be helpful in assisting in terms of disseminating information. You would have uh, what councillors uh, who are 
almost every corner of the Republic, given that South Africa is a wall-to-wall uh, municipal um, area. So I just want to check uh, whether that is happening. And if it is not happening, is it not the right time to start uh, exploring uh, that kind of um, 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 strategic uh, partnership with those institutions? Yes, of course. I appreciate the fact that they have um, not, they have initiated the engagement with institutions of higher learning. Um, it's a good thing to develop uh, the human capital, you know, uh, in terms of the consumer uh, legislative instruments. But we, it, it must go down to where people are, and especially those who are affected by these uh, illicit uh, business dealings. And secondly, Chair, um, this would also apply to the non-compliant uh, clothing and textile goods that uh, illicitly find their way into the shores of our country. Uh, and, and it compromises uh, the quality of the real brands uh, that are there in the market. And in this regard, the question would be, what preventative measures uh, has the commission employed uh, in support of uh, the clothing and textile master plans uh, to prevent the inflow of non-compliant clothing and textile goods in the country? Uh, the second question, um, Chair, we, 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 we do note that uh, there are some strides which the Commission is doing in, in, in the area of uh, advertisement. My question then would be, what has been the impact of your media coverage on work of the commission in full realization, of course, to the fact that not everybody would have access uh, to either electronic and or print uh, media. Um, and now how do we, for instance, how do we make sure that um, the local radio stations, you know, uh, that are closer or community radio stations, yeah, that's what I wanted to say, community radio stations, you know, um, uh, do have uh, programs where they intensify uh, the issue, I mean, the key issues around uh, the mandate functionality and areas that are important for the commission. Uh, so far, Chair, I think, let me pause there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Burns Mamashe, Honorable Mohatse, or oh, I see Honorable Mbuyani is back. Let us take Honorable Mbuyani. I, I know he has had a connectivity problems, and then we'll take Honorable Mohatse. Honorable Mbuyani. And sorry for that. I have a serious network challenge. Very quick, so that if I'm part of the meeting, I can be able to respond at you. Chair, I see in terms of the expenditure on salaries and the way it shows inconsistency through the three quarters. The, and the, your forecast for the fourth quarter is also distinct. Uh, what are the reasons for this? And also, what is the impact of the limited staff complements on the work of the commission? Given the fact that uh, we may need to know only the 79 
out of 132 approved posts are funded. Uh, what is being done uh, to correct this? Uh, thanks, Chair, for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Honorable Mbiani. Uh, Honorable Moatse. Thank you, Chairperson. No, I'm covered by the latter speakers with the questions. Okay, thank you very much. I see no further hands. Can I then hand over to Ms. Mabuza and her team to answer the uh, questions raised by the portfolio committee members? Thank you. Uh, um, thanks, um, thanks a lot for the questions that have been raised by the honorable members. I will um, try and respond to some of the questions. We'll start with the questions in relation to performance of information. And then uh, lastly, then um, I will also request that the um, CFO and also the company secretary assist me, but then the CFO will come in on the last question in relation to finances. Now, on the first question that was raised by Honorable Fring. Ms. Mabuza, relation, uh, sorry, Ms. Mabuza, I just want to interrupt you there uh, with apologies because I see Honorable McPherson has raised his hand. So I think before you proceed with the responses, let us take his question on board also. Honorable McPherson. Uh, thanks, thanks, Chair. Uh, I was just suffering with some load shedding, so I've only just been able to rejoin now. Um, so, so the question I just wanted to pose to the NCC uh, is really simple because I would assume that you know their mandate uh, or you know one of the things they should be doing is facilitating ease of being able to submit complaints from sort of the average public uh, and general public. And I'm just wondering. Um, if um, if the presenter could maybe just quickly show us how easy it is to submit a complaint uh, on their website. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's fairly easy. I haven't been able to find it, but maybe they can find it and just show me where and how uh, they submit a complaint through the website. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, that question is uh, very important like other questions raised but it goes to the nub of the matter how easy it is to to register cases on your website over to you Ms. Mabuza sorry for the interruption thank you um thanks um, um chairperson um I will start with the question that was raised by honorable Fring in relation to uh the being proactive in relation to dealing with the uh, Ponzi schemes. And um, I am certain in this area, um, our company secretary is going to talk much on it at a later stage, but we, we are in the task team of government um, that he will talk to at a later stage on how we can deal with it. But the problem here with some of the Ponzi schemes is that the participants themselves, they know that it is illegal to do that. And then they would only come to us once they realize that they are in dire need, they have lost funds. Hence, now we, um, we would react at a later stage. But then we work with other regulators, like in this case, the South African Reserve Bank, when they pick up anomalies in relation to deposit taking, they will alert us to say, we've been looking at this. And then what is happening here? Did you look at it and then the name of the person and all that and then the other processes will kick in and I am certain that the company secretary would relate to that. I will talk to that further. But then in relation to the uh, contaminated food, how we can be proactive um, and I, I know the concern of our Honorable Thring here, especially looking at what had happened with the demise of those children here, is that as the MCC we cannot become proactive. The owners of quality are the uh, suppliers themselves because in terms of the standard in health is that there should be periodic um, testing of goods and keeping lab results and wherein there are anomalies, 
they are supposed to inform us and say, this is what we had picked up, we want to recall, hence then you see the number of recalls. But we cannot become proactive as the MCC. But then uh, um, uh, in that area as well, is that we depend also on the Department of Health if there is any of also the anomalies that they have picked up from their side that suppliers, suppliers would have alerted them them too, wherein they should be now saying now to the MCC, MCC, we've picked up this and we think that maybe the supplier did not do A, B, and C in relation to the standard. Here, the issue of our food and the safety thereof is a joint a, a responsibility between the uh, uh, Department of uh, Trade, Industry, and Competition. And uh, we're looking uh, also at the Department of um, Agriculture and the Department of Health as well in a portfolio, but we do not have a dedicated person starting from uh, the, the, the production side until to the end that deals with that. We only come in when standards have been compromised and then we only have to inform the public and alert them of maybe the tell tales in terms of what could be the symptoms that they would be looking at and then also to return. So that is as far as we can move. But then in looking at the reinvestment as to how do we determine the reinvestment when it comes to consumer. The reinvestment is determined when we have investigated and the consumer says, I have paid a supplier, let's say I went to repair my gearbox, I've paid 12,000 and then the supplier remained in terms of, or well, maybe the service was not poor then the act says you put the consumer at a state where they have been before the transaction took place. In this case now, because they have lost 12,000, they will be paid back their 12,000. And then if it's about maybe a purchase of a motor vehicle here, when we argue those matters, let's say somebody purchased a motor vehicle for like, um, let's say 400,000, and mostly they will be a second-hand vehicle, so let's say for 200,000. That is what they have paid to the supplier. And then they have paid in as well the interest, and then they have paid in the warranty. When we argue as the MCC those matters, we will argue that the consumers be reimbursed the capital amount, the interest from the, the date on which they will have to, they, they have paid that amount to the date on which we were prosecuting the matter, and then also the money that they would have paid for the warranty. So the nature of the complaint determines the amount that will be reimbursed to a consumer. In relation to the um, success for your online camps and the impersonification that you have seen, especially related to your internet scams and all that, the company secretary will dwell onto that because he is working on a particular project or on a joint operation with other sector regulators but as we can say that our role as the MCC is not really to deal with the criminal side of it. It's when uh, we only deal with our mandates, when it becomes mostly of your Ponzi schemes and all that. The other online where in a person will be saying you've won this amount and then go claim your, 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 your car and all that, that becomes crim a criminal. It's dealt with by the subs. But then I think the, the company secretary will dwell much on that. And then I think as well, the other issue that was raised by an um, honorable uh, thing was around the communication on the joint indicators. Yes, um, the, in the beginning when the joint indicators were shared with all of us as entities of the DTI jointly, is that we had all these indicators and then we had no money and then we were only alerted to them, I think at the end before our APP could be approved for expenditure for the financial year. There, were, there had not been any better communication by that time. But since then, in quarter one, the DTIC really did much to engage us as entities to say, what is it that is expected of us and the form of reporting. That's why we could report from quarter one. And I think that has been cured because even this year with the changes in the indicators, the minister called us, we had a meeting uh, initially before we can even finalize the APPs to really rework or refine the joint indicator. So we will be reporting better even in the next financial year. And then um, Honorable Yaku asked, 
how can you as the portfolio committee really assist? I think um, what we can assist, it also relates to um, some of the questions or, or the, um, the nudging by uh, Honorable uh, Nyamashe, uh, Ben Nyamashe Beg in relation to just saying, um, this is another avenue that we think you could, you could follow, especially when we're looking at our um, traditional ways of communicating with Amakos and all that way, and we can piggyback on some of the other areas. I think that that is the assistance as well. And also, if we know that there will be some areas for the member of, members of parliament where in they already have audiences, and then you can invite us and say as the MCC, I have the audience with this community. Would you please join us on some of the other areas? Even if we have not planned for them, we'll make means of making sure that we go there and we assist. But what is really essential wherein we would need really your assistance is to look at our mandate, look at our baseline and see whether together you can assist us to persuade the DTIC and National Treasury to increase the baseline, especially looking at our mandate that even since the onset of the MCC, we were never funded. It's only after 10 years that we could set up an ICT infrastructure. We are pleading, please assist us into that, because I think that was a question that was also raised by Honorable McKisson, wherein he was saying, just show us and demonstrate how to submit a complaint. We haven't done that, uh, Honorable McPherson, in making sure that we make it easier for people to file a complaint online because we only commission our ICT back and infrastructure in December. We are working in, in that and it's one of the joint indicators of making easier for people to access our services. We cannot respond on that right now positively to say, this is how easy it is. We are working on that interface. It will be supported by our, by our back end infrastructure that we had recently established. And then also on the question that was raised by Honorable Mutawung in relation to the low numbers that we have said on the business initiatives and the consumer initiatives. Um, the reason that we have that we um, have here is that those targets, it's targets in relation to our budget because it also talks to us now traveling before, because before our infrastructure was that weak, we could not even rely on it, is that we, it, it was based on us being able to travel because when we're talking of business initiatives, we're talking of initiatives that we will have set up with specific associations and either, yeah, specific associations of population of businesses in terms of the different formations that we would like to engage. Some of them will set up their online sessions, but because it's dedicated businesses, we have to now structure our presentations to fit that business. And we only have one person that is responsible for business education and one person that is responsible for consumer education, hence also the numbers and the planning and all that. And also to say that we needed infrastructure to support us, but we also needed uh, wherein we need to travel to have online, on, uh, in-person or physical sessions to travel, but our goods and services doesn't allow us to do that. But then as also now what Honorable uh, Mutawun said, why didn't you meet your target in quarter two? I would say that in quarter two, we did not meet our target in business initiatives because we have now arranged that session with a bus two business formations that we were supposed to roll this presentation with and then they could not host us on the days on which we had agreed on they wanted, then they requested that we reschedule. Hence now would have overperformed in the third quarter in that area. Now, the question that was also raised was the investigations. Yes, we did not perform in all three quarters consecutively, as we said that one of the area is the complexity of the matters that we could, that we were supposed to investigate. And the second area as well is the numbers that we had. As we said, 
we have five investigators that would do the ports of entry and that will also come up and do our ordinary investigations. And then what we do is we use now the funds that we have to get interns to support the, investigator, the investigators. And then because now we had a high case load of investigations that we did not approve in the financial year 20 and 21, then we approved them in the beginning of the first quarter. Hence now we started the first quarter with just over 200 uh, investigations that we had completed that we had to complete. And the turnaround time that we normally give ourselves is around three months. And then we are trying our best with what we have. But then the complexity as well is that on certain investigations, like when you will be looking at food or maybe online stems or maybe also investigations into your pyramid schemes, we rely on other regulators or we have to procure services of either forensic investigators to go to some of the websites on areas wherein we had to investigate if that transaction happened online. And for that, we need resources and it takes time because we have to procure those resources uh, externally. So that is the reason that we promise that with the intents that we have and also the um, input that we have given in quarter two in the training and also bringing in some of our resources that we would find a way of really making sure that with the investigation, even if we set the target at 8% that we could not meet, but we promise that at the end of the financial year, we will try to do this. And we really wish that we could move the target to 100%, but with the five investigators that we have, and only the limited funds of like three positions that we could use to really fund intents, is that we are really constrained and hamstrung in that area. And then the area that was um, um, Honorable Malimacha raised the issue of the um, pyramid scheme investigations. I'm sure that uh, the company secretary will uh, look into that further elaborate when he responds. Now, uh, on the area that was raised specifically by uh, Honorable uh, Benz uh, Namashe around the issue of the rural communities, um, we really will try our best. But as we said that consumer protection is an area of uh, concurrency in jurisdiction with the provincial consumer affairs officers. Their role is to look at those uh, provinces wherein they are working at. And then when we look at the work of the NCC wherein we are looking at co cooperation with all other regulators within the consumer protection space, we have set up a consumer protection forum, which is really a voluntary body where we come together as regulators within the space and say, colleagues, these are the areas that are a little bit weak where in our outreach as consumer protection regulators, we are not being felt. And then we come up with ways of having this joint uh, um, investigations or maybe joint uh, awareness program. Hence, now you would see that in that area, the one of the provinces that we felt that it was underserviced, it was in the Northern Cape. And hence in quarter three, when one of our regulators um, went there, we then went together and then it gave that area of where it seems that we have um, uh, overperformed. But then on being preventative, on the areas of a non-compliant goods and textiles is that we can be proactive when we stop them at the ports of entry. But only what we are allowed to look at is only the 4% that will be set aside that the um, customs will uh, flag and then when there is non-compliance will go there, will go there and check and then send those goods back or maybe or ensure that they are being destroyed. But on other areas, once they hit our show, our capacity is so limited. And then it's where in we rely on the concurrency that we have with other jurisdictions to take their part and do their inspections. But then when we're looking at the illicit, especially where in now, you will be looking at counterfeiting and all that, that will be the, the 
um, the jurisdiction of the CIPC in terms of the brand marketing and all that, that is where in they come in. But we really wanted to look to make sure that we become proactive as much as possible, but we only come at the end. But then that proactivity comes in when we do joint enforcement. And the impact that we have there on the media coverage is that when we issue a media statement in this area, even if we would say that we would have um, now participated in 74 radio stations or, or maybe 60 radio stations, most of them are your community radio stations. What we do to make sure that consumers in our rural areas and in our township economies can hear us is that most of your community radio stations, they can't afford to call us. What we do is when we have a story, our media liaison person would even say that I am available, I can call you back. We even call them back to share with them and show, share with our consumers wherein they've given us a slot using, using the fees of the MCC. So we try as much, but the impact now, when we go out there, we attract a lot of other complaints that at the ultimate end, we still have to send back to the provinces because they will have jurisdiction, especially where in the supplier and the consumer are in the same province. I will pause the uh, chair and request that um, the company secretary start first with uh, um, supplementing the information on a uh, on performance, questions related to performance, and then the uh, CFO will then respond to the question on, um, on uh, the, the, the uh, issues that were raised by Honorable Mbiyane on the um, expenditure on cost of employment, and also on the impact uh, that we had with the limited staff of the MCC. I think both the company and the secretary would be able to respond. Thank you, uh, Chair. I'll hand over to them. Thanks. Thank you, NCC team. Good Proceed. morning, honorable members, and um, good morning, colleagues. Um, on the question about systems that are in place to be proactive on Ponzi schemes and as well as uh, product recalls, um, the NCC is part of a task force called South African Anti-Money Laundering Task Team. Um, it is comprised of various um, law enforcement agencies. We have as a standing member, the NPA's Asset Forfeiture Unit. However, we are still working on having a standing member uh, from the out and out prosecutions side of the NPA. Also, we also having a little bit of a challenge um, from the SAPS side to have the standing investigators on their side to assist us with this investigation. Now, that is one step um, at ensuring that there is some level of proactivity. Then, we have also had meetings with the banks because uh, uh, the majority of the transactions, they happen using the uh, banking platforms. Now the banks, in as much as they are required by the uh, licensing conditions to report certain sus uh, suspicious transactions to the reserve bank, the Consumer Protection Act then does not require them to report, but it allows them to be a whistleblower. So we've had a meeting with them and uh, we have um, uh, assisted with the, the, the forms that they will then complete to then alert us of all suspicious transactions. And then we will start our investigations from that stage to ensure that we at least stop some of the schemes. It must be said at this stage that there is a lot of Ponzi schemes um, 
there has been a considerable rise. Some of them are copycats. Some of them, they, the person will open a number of these schemes. Now, some schemes are very prolific. Some, because we catch them in the beginning, not much money has um, exchanged hands. It is almost impossible to investigate each and every one of them. And even then, once we've investigated, we then share our report with the NPA and request them to preserve those funds pending our, our prosecution of the perpetrators of the schemes. Now, you find that in other instances, there is so little money that is left that the costs of obtaining the preservation order are far outweighed by the amounts that we're seeking to preserve. We are also trying to fine tune those processes um, so that every cent that we can find, it can then be preserved. Now, on the same issue, now talking specifically about Mufiwa, where 27 million was actually stemmed from persons in South Africa and the SADC region, but we could only find 600,000. Um, uh, what happens is because these things are illegal and they typically involved, they involve your money laundering. So the investigation involves following the money. We do not necessarily have the expertise there Yes, we have the powers to summon the bank statements from the banks so that we can follow the money, but we do not necessarily have the expertise. We then rely on other regulators who have the expertise to assist us to follow the money. What we have seen is that when an amount comes into a bank account today, immediately the amount moves around so fast. Some of it goes, it leaves our shores. Some of it goes into this um, uh, 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 digital currencies, your Bitcoins and this cryptocurrency. Uh, some of it, there are money mules that are used and it's then converted into cash and it becomes difficult to trace. That's why you would find that in a month, 200 million can be stolen, but in the same month, you will only find that there is less than a million that is left in accounts that we can trace and freeze. But we believe that this um, trust team, the anti-money laundering trust team will assist us a lot in uh, quickly tracing the money and quickly stopping the, the bank accounts and quickly uh, 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 preserving the funds. Now, the banks have been very cooperative in that once they report and we go back to them to say, yes, it is a Ponzi scheme, they immediately on their own start placing freezes on these accounts. That at least allows us and the NPA time to then preserve the funds. Now, on the the commissioner did um, uh, give a response on the determination of the reinvestment of funds to consumers. So every consumer who has lost money, um, in the case of pyramid schemes, the law makes everyone an offender who participates in a criminal, in a Ponzi scheme. Now, in our law, the word Ponzi scheme doesn't exist. We just use it to refer to all the schemes. So there are various schemes. There are schemes that are victimless where everyone is seen as an offender. And in that case, whatever money we find will be forfeited to the state. So the intention there is to remove the proceeds of unlawful activities. There are other schemes where there are victims. But because so little will be found, then the consumers will invariably receive 
rent to the sands, where everything that has been found will have to be shared equally amongst the victims. And for those consumers, for example, those who um, have received a bad deal, for example, the example used by the commissioner of a defective car, in this instance, the law simply says you, the amount that must be refunded is the purchase price or the price of the goods that were bought or the, the services. In other instances, the law includes interest, but when we then go, because we literally go to a court to then ask for the reimbursement, we, in our papers, we put the highest amount possible, but it is up to now the judges of the tribunal if they agree with our arguments and then they will determine the amounts. The same goes with the administrative fines. We argue for the highest fine possible and the tribunal determines the amount. But I can then state now that the minimum will always be the actual purchase price and the interest will be the rate that the tribunal will deem fit. The investigations we have, the CPA is a very ambitious law. It is very wide and very varied. So it deals with almost anything and everything. So you can see that it deals with your normal everyday food purchases to your furniture purchases to vehicle purchases. And at the same time, it then deals with criminal aspects in a way, like in the Ponzi schemes, your, it, it contains anti-money laundering aspects. Now it deals with um, uh, 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 imports of goods and services as well. Now that on its own, in an ideal world, you would have had specialized investigators that deal with specific types of investigations. That would make the investigation go quicker. In as much as it deals with defective goods, today you might be faced with a defective vehicle and then you need to understand how the engine works so that you can then investigate the complaint. But tomorrow you might be dealing with solar and solar uh, products. So it then requires various expertise. And then the other, when you come to scams, some of them are online, are happy, are, they happen on the internet and so on. You now require forensic internet expertise. So that plays a role in the time taken to finalize investigations. Um, but we are doing our best, as the commissioner said, with what we have. Now, the investigation specifically relating to the deaths that were allegedly caused by the noodles. The biggest challenge we had there was first determining the brand of the noodles so that we can then know the brand owner. That information took long to discover. Even when we had the information, we didn't have the information that says specifically this is the brand. However, we had information that makes us suspect that this is the brand and it then had to be investigated. And as the con commissioner indicated, it includes uh, the various products having to be taken to labs to be subjected to tests and we wait for those tests. Should the investigation reveal that a particular company is indeed responsible for uh, exposing to the public to goods that are not safe. 
the NCC will then prosecute that company. And um, the law dictates that we can only prosecute um, to have the company to be declared in, pro, in, in, in contravention of the CPA and then a fine to be imposed. The CPA then says those who suffered as a result of defective goods or unsafe goods are entitled to damages, but it does not give the NCC the powers to seek those damages. It then says a certificate of prohibited conduct will be issued and the affected persons can then approach normal courts to obtain those damages. It then takes away that power from us to now leave the specialized court being the National Consumer Tribunal and go to ordinary courts. It does not give us that power. It says those who suffered can then go that route. Um, in these typical cases, those consumers will then have to approach your legal aid board for assistance. I just need to add that on consumer education and in particular the media, the NCC also has standing time slots with certain radio stations where on a specific weekday, on a specific time, we are guests in, in, in those um, radio shows and we share various subjects on the CPA with consumers with the intention of educating them. And on how we are do or what we are doing to stem the inflow of non-compliant goods. We have a standing arrangement, an MOU with the South African uh, 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 Revenue Service, uh, who then stop and inspect certain goods, which they are just preliminary investigations, and then they notify us of the detained goods. That works a very well because it, now we are able, they are always at every port of entry, be it road um, and sea, they are always at the ports. So they then notify us immediately upon stopping goods for us to investigate. That is proactive enough to at least um, stop this uh, non-compliant goods from coming into the Republic. But we are also working with the South African police services who have a wider mandate where they are also able to follow consignments. There are some consignments that are able to pass the ports and go to warehouses. They are able to follow those consignments to the warehouses and investigate them there and notify us. That partnership is working very well and we are always having refresher courses with both the revenue service and the SAPS on the law because they also have new members joining now and then to make sure that they understand what the provisions are and this has um, uh, 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 yielded positive results because not only are we able to stop those that come to the Republic, but those that, as the commissioner uh, stated, it's only 4%. There are some that are not stopped that pass through, but with the help of the, with the, help of the SAPS, we are able to follow them to the uh, 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 warehouses and we are then in a position to remove them from the Republic through re-exportation or them being destroyed at accredited facilities. Thank you, members. Thank you very much. Um, can I then just check? Um, you said, um, Ms. Mabuza, that you're going to hand over to the CFO. 
Yes, Chair, the CFO okay. will respond with a question that was raised by uh, Honorable Mbuyane. Okay, thank you. Is that Mushidi? Yes, Ms. Honorable. Mushidi, thank you. Good morning, Honorable Members. Um, I'm going to answer the question by uh, Mr. Mbuyane regarding the expenditure on compensation of employees. So um, when you look at quarter four, it is forecasted to be a 12.2 million, which is a little bit uh, higher than what uh, the actual for quarter one, two, and three were. So at the beginning of the financial year, during quarter one, our organizations uh, had various uh, vacancies. Hence, the compensation of employees for quarter one were the, the lowest with 11 million. Uh, then quarter two and quarter three, uh, some of these positions were filled, being the uh, director SPM was filled in quarter one, uh, director finance and the uh, CFO was filled in quarter two, and the senior researcher was filled in quarter three. Uh, on top of that, we also had some exit, uh, whereby for now in quarter um, four, we had an exit for, for the ICT senior manager, even though we did fill a position for the uh, legal advisor. But when you look at the uh, two splits of the compensation of employees, we do have salary and wages that uh, was mainly the one I explained now. And the second portion is the social contributions. Uh, quarter four is high, uh, forecasted to be a little bit higher because uh, it's the end of the financial year and there will be items that will have to be um, recognized when we close the books for the 2021 2022 financial year. Those will be the lift gratuity and the saving checks or the bonus, service bonuses whereby our employees uh, opted to save their portions in this current financial year, even though we will not pay them uh, out to them uh, by the 31st of March. So we'll have to recognize them uh, at the end of the financial year because it is what is uh, perceived to have been earned uh, or paid to them in this current financial year. And again, on this social contribution, we do have a pension a contribution by the employer and the medical aid as well as UIF. So hence, uh, it is a little bit higher on, on quarter four. Um, the second question um, asked by Mr. Mbuyani was, uh, why is there a limit on a staff establishment? Uh, the problem is funding. Uh, as the commissioner has uh, emphasized, we've been struggling with finding since uh, the organization started. Hence, even though the, at the beginning, the establishment was for a headcount of 132 employees, but we are always around 23 uh, warm bodies or actual people occupying those positions uh, with uh, 79 funded positions. And the third question is, uh, what is it being done to supplement this staff uh, uh, shortage? Uh, currently, uh, we do have uh, we do offer internships, and that is uh, norm what is actually assisting us for now. But it's clearly not sustainable because uh, the citizens of South Africa are now getting aware of our mandate. They now understand what we are doing, the role that we are playing in their lives. And the more they start uh, complaining is the more that we need more uh, uh, staff uh, in, to assist, especially with the investigations. Uh, but currently, to answer the question, we are uh, using the internships. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for those explanations. I saw on the on the chat that Honourable um, McPherson has requested a follow up question. Can I just see if there are any other follow up questions? A show of hands. Okay, so on over to you, Honourable yeah. McPherson, to raise your follow up question. You know, Chair, it strikes me is amazing that, you know, the the two thing that the NTC should be doing in my mind is, um, is, is being able to be accessible to the public, 
to be able to receive complaint and then be able to investigate them. And they seem unable to do either of those. Now, the lack of being able to make complaints on the website has existed since 2019. This is not something new, Commissioner, and yet the, the same status remains. Um, and, and it's really, it's not good enough that the public cannot go onto the website and lodge a complaint. What, I mean, how do you expect anyone to actually interact with the NCC unless they either pitch up to their offices or have, uh, you know, uh, access to scanners and so on and so forth? And so I think that this is a real indictment on the NCC that they seem at the very basic being able to fulfill their very job. Chair, it would be like going to an ice cream store and them not having any ice cream. I mean, you would just, you, you couldn't run a store like that. But that's exactly how the NCC is running the operation. And so I really think that this committee needs to, uh, you know, cut through some of the fluff and excuses that have been laid out on the table here today um, and actually needs to get to the grip of, uh, of uh, you know, of, of what is not happening in this entity because it's an important entity to the public and they just have no ability or no willingness to interact with the public and actually investigate the, the, uh, the issues that are brought before them. Now, imagine how much worse things would be for the NCC if the public actually were able to easily lodge complaints. And maybe that's actually closer to the truth as to why they don't want the public to lodge complaints with them, and certainly not since 2019, because then it would actually require some real work uh, to be done. So the committee needs to get to the grips with what is not happening uh, in this entity, as it's a very serious failure and dereliction of duty. Thanks. Thank you very much, Honorable McPherson. Um, before I hand over to uh, the Acting Commission, I see there is another hand from Honorable Burns Mamashe. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Honorable Chair. Um, I, I, I just wanted to um, kind of uh, make a proposal to uh, the Commission, you know, uh, that if, 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 if you look into uh, the challenges that we have in relation to uh, unemployment and inequality, uh, our people um, do almost everything and anything if it has a potential uh, to bring them money. And, and you can see by the proliferation of uh, these uh, pyramid schemes and so on that are happening, you know, in, in, including these uh, um, um, so-called um, crypto, whatever, um, 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 investments. Crypto you can see that, yeah. Yes, you, you can see that the, 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 the extent of desperation, you know, because unemployment is very high. Inequality is widening. South Africa is the most unequal um, 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 country. Uh, um, um, rather, where inequality is 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 very wide, and it has a, a, a of course we know it has a historical context. Now, where I'm getting at, Honourable Chair, is that um, we need to equip our people with information. You know, um, that the, there's an old say that says. Um, with knowledge, uh, you are empowered. Without knowledge, you are disempowered. So in this case, we have established institutions 
uh, nationally. Uh, in this case, you've got the National House of Traditional Leaders. You've got Salga, where all, almost all municipalities uh, participate. Now, 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 if uh, the commission would institutionalize a relationship with those institutions, and that relationship would also cascade to lower levels at provincial as well as local level. Um, that will assist in disseminating the information which will be helpful in our people to remain vigilant in being exploited by uh, illicit operators who would ordinarily exploit their extent of ignorance on one hand, but also uh, their desperation on the other hand in an attempt uh, to change uh, their lives. You see, because as, as they do all these things, it's not as though perhaps, um, put it differently, it's a, it's a, to them, they actually see an easy opportunity without really knowing that all of this is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a scam which is about making them even to lose the least that they have. So if we can intensify that part of ensuring that the information um, is shared with them at the various levels uh, using uh, the current institutional arrangements that are there, um, uh, which, 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 to me, that, that will be very helpful in empowering them. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much. As I hand uh, back to the Acting Commissioner, uh, you know, I think uh, COO, the Acting COO that's on the platform, we get countless entities coming to account uh, to the PC, and then we hear this refrain about Northern Cape being neglected or you know, the targets not being met for no Northern Cape, et cetera. I think we must have a specific focus to see how we can reach our more rural provinces in the work that is done by the department and its entities. And then to the commission, I just want to check. If you are saying that IT is working on, on, on the electronic uh, registering of complaints on your website. When will they, if we hear that this has been going on since 2019, what is your estimate by when that uh, work will be complete in terms of a member of the public going to your website clicking on a button and registering a consumer complaint. Over to you, Acting Commissioner. Thank you, uh, members, and um, thank you. I think the concern raised by uh, um, Honorable McPherson, I think it's being understood. Um, we are really working on that, it's as you said. That on the okay. We are working on that and we envisage to really finish the process and piloting it uh, from the end of July. As we're saying that we were waiting for the interfaces. And I know that it might seem that um, we are dragging our feet, but I think that just given that we had to set up this infrastructure so that we can have a normal case management system like any other entities, is that we are doing our best. And hence, even what we had initially failed last year in terms of the old servers and all that. So we are grateful that we have what we have, but we are going to do our best because once we even have the case management system, it will also assist us to report and see in terms of workflow where we are actually, what is it that we are doing? But to also mitigate that, it's not all the consumers that will have the um, 
funds to really uh, follow the online processes. We even went in in 2020, 2021 to set up a um, toll free number as the NCC. We also have a toll free number to make sure that we are being reached and we assist consumers. Yes, the filing of the complaint still has to be scanning and all that, but um, that is what we are doing to try and assist. And um, in uh, now, Looking at the areas that were uh, the area that was raised, the advice given by Honourable uh, Opens, uh, yeah, Honourable is it Opens, yes, is that um, we really will try to make sure that we use those institutions. We um, look at ways of really within our system build those relationships, as we said that we have the Consumer Protection Forum wherein we can even sensitize our counterparts at provincial level to leverage on their relationships. I think we will do that. And then next time when we meet you, we would report better on that area to say what is it that we've done. And then we really welcome that advice that has been given. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, we note those issues for, for follow up and we thank um, the Consumer Commission uh, team who has mm -hmm. reported to us here, and um, we will now continue with our agenda, which I think, uh, Committee Secretary, it's minutes. That's correct, Chair. We'll Thank ask you. Margaret to flag the first set of minutes dated the 15th of February. Thank you. Will you take us through, Secretary? I will do so, Chair. Chair, we, on the 15th of February, we had a briefing by the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition on the Equity Equivalent Investment Program. And we also received a briefing from, from the BBBEE Commission on activities over the 2020-21 financial year, Chair. Chair, we had, um, I think, majority of members were present for that for those for that proceedings. Chair, um, Chair, we we the deputy minister uh, um, was also present and and with, together with Mr. Maputa proceeded to brief the committee on the equity equivalent program. The committee highlighted a number of issues during its deliberations. Um, as captured from 2.2.1, Chair. Then we had a briefing by the Triple B Commission on its activities for, for the financial year. Ms. Zodvin and the team proceeded to brief the committee on that, Chair. And from, from point 3.3.21, point the committee highlighted some of the issues that were important for them during the discussion, during that briefing, Chair. Then, Chair, the, the meeting then adjourned at 12.55 until Wednesday, the 16th of February, Chair. Thank you very much. If we are satisfied that that's a correct reflection of our minutes of the meeting of the 15th of February, can I ask for a mover and a second for the adoption of the minutes, please? Chair, we have Ms. Mwatsi, Chair. Ms. Mwatsi. Thank you, Chairperson. I move for adoption of the minutes as presented. Thank you very much, Honorable Mwatsi. I need a seconder for the adoption of the minutes. Otherwise, the minutes must stand over if we're not adopting it. Is there a seconder to the proposal that we adopt the minutes, members? It could be members are struggling to maybe raise their hand. Yeah. Ms. Yaku, Chair. Honorable Yaku. Uh, for the sake of peace, Chair. <laughs> <laughs> and progress. Thank you very much for being progressive. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, can we go to the next set of minutes, which is the 16th of February, and we've got quite a few sets to get through. So um, be ready to either uh, approve or reject the minutes. Thank you. Chair, we met second. on the 16th and we had a briefing by the DTIC on the second and third quarter financial and non-financial performance for the 2021-22 financial year, Chair. Chair, um, you'll see, I think there is apologies, Chair, if I'm correct, Chair, for that meeting. Yes, Ms. Yaku was not present for that particular meeting, Chair. If we go down, Chair, we the, then the acting D, I think no, it was not the acting DGG. It was Mr. Mr. Khan, who, who was in the place of the acting DGG, proceeded to brief the committee. Chair, we have distributed the draft report to members and requested that they submit um, concluding remarks and recommendations because we're proceeding with that matter tomorrow. Um, we considered draft minutes dated the 8th of February, Chair and the committee had resolved that the outstanding sponsors should be submitted by the 23rd of February, which we have received the chair. The meeting adjourned at 11.54 until Tuesday the 22nd of, that's wrong. Yeah, correct chair, the 2nd of February, thanks. Thank you very much members. There is a, the, the minutes of the 16th of February. Can I have a move and a second for the adoption of the minutes as table? Chair, we have Ms. Moatse again, Chair. Ms. Mo uh, Honorable Moatse, and then Honorable yes. Mulder. Honorable Thank Moatse. you very much. Thank you very much, Chairperson. I move for adoption of the set minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Mulder. Honorable Chair, I'll second the move for adoption. Thank you very much. That uh, deals with the minutes of the 16th. We now move to the minutes of the 22nd of February. Chair, we, the committee met on 22nd and received the briefing by DTC on trade policy. And, and, and receive, also receive an update on trade negotiations, as well as on implementation of trade agreements, Chair. Chair, we um, had, I'm just gonna go, I'll go down. We had apology from Mr. McPherson for the 22nd Chair. Chair, go down, Mongo. Chair, Ambassador Karim, brief the committee on, on the trade policy matters and matters related to that. The committee raised a number of issues captured in 2.2.1, Chair. If you go down, Margot, as captured there. And then the meeting adjourned at 11.15 until Wednesday, the 23rd of February, Chair. We have the hands of the smart say, Chair. Smart say. Honorable Marcia. Yeah. Yes, Chair. I move for adoption of the set minutes. Thank you very much for being so combat ready. Um, can I have a seconder for the adoption of the minutes? Ms. Yaku. Honorable Yaku. No. I second the adoption of the minutes. Thank you very much. We now move to the adoption of the minutes of the 23rd, 23rd of February. Chair, on 23rd of February, I took the chair to proceed with the election of the chairperson. Uh, um, and we also welcome a new member on that day, Ms. Madam, Mr. Malamakia, to the committee. And there afterwards, we proceeded to get a briefing by the DTIC, the NRCS, and the SABs on the public protection report regarding illegal conversions of goods carrying Toyota quantum vans into passenger carrying minibus taxis. We go down, Chair.
We have apologies from Mr. Oh, Mr. Kring yeah. and Ms. Ya Ms. Yaku. And we go down. Chair, we proceeded with the election of the chairperson. You were nominated as chairperson and elected, duly elected as the chairperson of the committee. Then we proceeded to get the briefing by the, on by DTRC on the public effectors report, followed by, I think, the SABs and the NRC. And as indicated, there will be a report uh, um, um, produced in relation to this chair. And because we were, ha we're having a follow-up meeting in, in this regard. The resolution was um, that we should, DTI should submit a detailed report. We have received detailed report and I will distribute it today to members, Chair. And then the meeting adjourned 11.23 until the 1st of March. Chair, Mr. Burns Namashi, Harais Chair. Honorable Burns Namashi. Although, Chair, it was a leg at hand, but uh, I would uh, move for the adoption of the minutes. Thank you very much. Honorable Moatse. Seconded, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Uh, we move to the minutes then of the 1st of March. Chair, we're on the 1st of March receiving a briefing by the DTIC on the 2020-21 annual incentive report, Chair. Um, we had an apology from Mr. McPherson, Chair. We, Ms. Mongole, proceeded to brief the committee on the incentive report, Chair, and the committee highlighted the number of issues captured from 2.2.1. A number of reports the committee resolved that the DTRC provide outstanding responses to questions within five days. They that matter was raised, I think, by Mr. Mulder that presentations should be submitted timelessly in order for members to um, prepare for the meetings. And the secretary that should schedule a follow up meeting with the DTRC to, to brief us on his plan to ensure uptake of incentives programs in more rural provinces, in particular the Northern Cape, and and in, in relation and his role in relation to that the district development model model chair. That meeting probably will be part of the second quarter program. Meeting adjourned at 1033 until the 2nd of March. Thank you very much. Uh, as I call for hands, I just want to request that you fix the minute in terms of attendance. You still have me as acting whereas I was elected in the meeting of the 23rd. Mm. So just a small typo there. Honorable mm -hmm. Mbiani. Chairperson, thank you for the opportunity. I rise to propose that we adopt the minutes. Thank you very much, Honorable Mbiani. Can we have a seconder? Honorable Malia, yeah, Mal Malia. 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 I rise to second from the chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Malamacha, uh, for, for seconding the adoption of that minute. Um, we now move to the minute. The last minute is the minute of the 2nd of March. Um, Chairperson, we had a meeting with the SIU on the status of its investigations into allegations of corruption and at the National Authorities Commissions. And we also considered, uh, considered the amended committee program, Chair. If we can go down, Chair. I think everyone was present for that particular meeting, Chair. Um, if we go down, we advocate Motibi and Mr. Le the care to brief the committee on the status of in allegations of corruption at the National Lotteries Commission, 2.1.2.1, highlighted the issues raised by the members in relation to that chair. If we go down, chair.
chair will also be considered the minute program, which was as a result of the correspondence we received from the minister, Mr. Patel, requesting that we, for an extension, to consider the submissions on the copyright and performance protection amendments bill. And the committee acceded to that request, hence the um, changes to the agenda items. We also subsequently submitted that um, um, pro amended program to the House Chairperson for approval, which he subsequently did chair. Then the, the committee resolved, Chair, once the SIU has submitted the phase one report to the presidency, it would ensure when the report may be made available to the committee. If the report is available, the committee will then schedule a further briefing on the report. The Minister of Trade and Industry and Competition shall also brief the committee on measures that have been implemented and future steps to prevent any further malfeasance at the NLC. Um, Chair, just to embark on I had a discussion on the word malfeasance, seeing that we always try to uh, make uh, um, the limits as reader-friendly read, um, um, read as possible, and whether the word maladministration should not <laughs> replace the word malfeasance, Chair. That is the minutes meeting adjourned at 11.58 until Tuesday, the 8th of March, 2022. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to, uh, you to go to number two, to the uh, heading of number two. I think it's incorrect because you refer to the incentive report. I Have think it's check, the problem of cut and paste, yeah. Yeah, let me see, Chair. Yeah, we will correct that, Chair. Apologies for that. We will we'll do so, Chair. Okay, and then as I call for the adoption of the minutes, uh, please express yourself on whether we should replace the word malfeasance with maladministration. Thank you very much. Um, can I have movers for the adoption of these minutes? Yes. Mr. Mutahun, Chair. Members. Honorable Motaung. Honorable Motaung, unmute yourself. Honorable Mbuyani. Thank you very much, Chairperson. I rise to propose that we adopt the minutes as uh, corrected. Thank you. Thank you. And so you agree we should replace malfeasance with maladministration? Yes, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Can I call for somebody to second the adoption of the minutes? Honorable yes, Burns, Mark you. Honorable Burns, Mamashi. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Uh, I rise to second the minutes. I, I thought that um, uh, I should apologize to Honorable Yako because I seem to have taken the responsibility to second the uh, minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Look at that beautiful smile. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, that deals with all the minutes. I think it's just closing remarks, um, uh, company secretary. Sorry, not company secretary, um, speaking Mr. to your future committee secretary. <laughs> yes, that's correct, Chair. It just, yeah. um, if, I'm, if you normally ask that, I indicate what we're doing tomorrow. Shall I yeah, proceed just, to doing that? Yes, yeah. No, no, just before I want to okay. just speak to the issue that it's, International Women's Day today. No problem. And, um, International Women's Day, the theme is gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. Focusing on advancing gender equality in the context of the global climate uh, crisis. Imagine a gender equal world, a world free of bias, stereotypes and discrimination a world that is diverse, equitable, and inclusive, a world where difference is valued and appreciated and celebrated. So we're calling on everyone to break the bias. 
over to you, uh, committee secretary, to uh, inform us about our next meeting. Um, Chair, we, our next meeting is we will get a, 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 a report from the DTIC, NRCS and SABS on the conversion with a specific focus on the remedial action to address the ministers of trade to it proposed by the public protector by the minister, for the minister of trade and industry chair. So the focus tomorrow will purely be on the remedial action that was undertaken by the DTIC in relation to the public protectors report, because that's the essence of the recommendation that were made by the public protector and the committee needs to um, um, ascertain whether the uh, action taken, they are satisfied with that. So the report will purely focus on that chair. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that will be a follow on from the previous presentation we, we received and uh, which contained a lot of the background information. Uh, so that is what we will foc focus on tomorrow. And with that, I declare this meeting closed and we'll see each other tomorrow. Break the bias. Thank you, Don't Chair. Leave the chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Break the bias. Thank you, Chair. Recording stopped.